Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. We'll get started in just a moment. Thank you to all that are joining us from all over the world today. My name is John Jacoby. I'm the CEO of Goodweave International. Welcome again. Stacy shared the name of the panel. Um, we're delighted to be part of this side event with the OECD uh, Forum. And just a real honor to have this virtual roundtable on behalf of Goodweave International. I just first want to thank a few, not only the OECD for hosting the, the, the session and choosing a topic that's both crucial and timely, but also my team uh, at Goodweave International, small yet mighty, uh, Sylvia Mira, Jamir Munaiko, and the rest of the team for just very thoughtfully and thoroughly preparing us for this session today. I was thrilled to arrive at Goodweave International last September. I've been building on 20 years of experience at this intersection of advocacy and philanthropy and think tanks on the issues that we're talking about today, responsible business, human and worker rights, and inclusive development. Goodweave's mission is to end child labor in global supply chains permanently. We elevate this topic today because of the urgent need to find and to fix hazardous child labor where it typically exists in the hidden and informal tiers of complex and fragile supply chains, including the, the garment and footwear sectors. I'm delighted, therefore, to be moderating a panel of terrific speakers to do just that. I want to start with a quote from Goodweave's founder, Indian activist and 2014 Nobel Peace Prize laureate Kailash Satyarthi. Kailash said, first of all, everyone must acknowledge and feel the child slavery still exists in the world in its ugliest face and form. And this is an evil, a crime against humanity that's intolerable, unacceptable, and must go. That sense of recognition must be developed first of all. Secondly, there's a need for higher amounts of political will. There's a need for higher amounts of corporate engagement and the engagement of the public towards it. So everybody has a responsibility to save and protect the children on this planet. I share Kailash's quote because it reminds us of how egregious the issue of child labor, hazardous and illicit, can be. It remains a pervasive issue affecting supply chains globally, and it's increasing. An estimated 160 million child laborers, up by nearly 8 to 10 million since the pandemic, now toil in virtually every country in the world. Often they're hidden in remote, undocumented locations and concealed in workplaces that lack monitoring and visibility. Economic pressures, informality, climate impacts, especially on uh, human migration, further exacerbate the problem, making it crucial to, de to develop effective approaches to mitigate and remediate this issue. The numbers are not specific in this case to the garment and textile sector, but key countries for this sector India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, to name only a few, are on the most recent U.S. Department of Labor list of goods made by child labor. Kailash also mentions in his quote the ingredients of shared responsibility amongst influential actors. We know how important it is that diverse players not only engage each other, but also drive solutions together. He starts with political will. It's of our public sector leaders. We need government rules to shape trade and corporate behavior and public resources to match in buying countries, consuming countries in other words. We also need government rules and resources to enforce labor laws already on the books in producing countries. We also need corporate engagement and leadership as he pointed out. Businesses have to adhere to the mandatory measures that our public sector leaders come up with. And also to be able to implement the voluntary measures that complement those mandatory measures that go above and beyond and show leadership. The, the public, civil society also plays a crucial role. So we need to be able to focus their attention as consumers toward our businesses. In our case, as Goodweave, we have a certification label to meet consumers where they are and engage them with an ethical supply chain. Consumers can also exist as citizens. People are citizens as well and can engage and advocate toward their governments, along with civil society advocates and activists, to be able to press upon systemic solutions, the policy issues that can, and programs that can take us to scale to address the scourge of child labor. So during this session, we'll hear from leaders across the anti-child labor movement, making change at the grassroots level, in corporate boardrooms, 
and in the national and global policy arena about pragmatic solutions and approaches to reverse these troubling trends in child labor. I'm now excited to introduce our very first speaker to offer some opening remarks. Simply put, Thea Lee is a powerhouse policymaker here in Washington. Thea is that rare policymaker that speaks truth to power, even while in power. As the U.S. Deputy Undersecretary of Labor for International Affairs, Thea leads the International Bureau, ILAB, at the U.S. Department of Labor. In three short years, she's elevated ILAB's profile and its impact across a wide range of global worker rights and protections. Previously, Thea was president of the Economic Policy Institute, a progressive and pro-worker think tank here in Washington, and has held leadership roles previously for 20 years at the AFL-CIO, the largest trade union confederation here in the United States. It's been a privilege to work with Thea for these 20 years, and I want to now hand it over to you, Thea, for some uh, challenging and hopefully insightful, I'm sure, opening remarks. Over to you, Thea. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for that great introduction. And let me add my congratulations to you for taking on a leadership role at Goodweave, which is an extraordinary and valued partner to the US Department of Labor in this important work. So we are thrilled to see you there. and We're thrilled to partner with Goodweave. I wanna thank you and Sylvia and the entire Goodweave team for inviting us to participate today. And also thank the OECD for convening today's event. And I'm really excited about hearing from the panelists. You've assembled a terrific set of panelists uh, with some real on the ground experience and I look forward to learning from them in a few minutes. I'm so proud to represent the Biden-Harris administration at this consequential moment in history. Under the leadership of our country's most pro-labor president in the history of the United States. President Biden and Vice President Harris have put workers at the very center of our economic agenda, both domestic and foreign, including through last December's launch of the presidential memorandum that lays out a global labor strategy as a whole of government approach to advancing and elevating workers' rights at home and abroad. Combating child labor at home and abroad is one of the highest priorities for the US Department of Labor, and it has been at the core of our work at the Bureau of International Labor Affairs since 1994. You may know about our office reports, and John, I think you mentioned our biannual list of goods produced by child labor or forced labor, and we also put out an annual uh, findings on the worst forms of child labor that covers 131 countries, looks not just at what the state of their practice is on child labor, but also gives recommendations to governments about ways they can improve and strengthen both their labor laws and their enforcement. All of that research is available on an app that you can download onto your phone, Sweat and Toil, thousands of pages of DOL research that can give you some a lot of details on over 131 countries. ILAB has also piloted hundreds of initiatives around the world to document child labor and forced labor, raise awareness, strengthen government enforcement capacity, provide tools for worker-centered compliance, and support labor unions and civil society efforts to promote workers' rights. Most recently, we are also increasing our focus on forced labor enforcement, putting our tools and our expertise to work on the Interagency Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, and on implementing the import prohibition on goods produced in whole or in part with forced labor in the Tariff Act of 1930 and the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. We've learned that we need a comprehensive approach to addressing labor exploitation, one that includes strong laws and protections for workers, effective enforcement of labor laws, and worker-driven social compliance. We also know that engaging unions and workers' organizations at every single stage is the key to ending child labor and other labor abuses. Working parents need the freedom to organize so that they can advocate for decent wages, childcare, safe conditions, and acceptable working hours so they can take care of their families. And we know that if parents have decent work, their kids are much, likely, much less likely to engage in child labor. Today's panel asks an important question. Is whole, um, can holistic due diligence stop child labor in global supply chains? The answer is yes, and I want to offer three considerations relevant to the garment and footwear sectors. First of all, we need to tackle child labor where it often starts, at the bottom of supply chains, as John mentioned in his opening remarks. In the case of the garment sector, the bottom of the supply chain is cotton production. According to the ILO, of the 160 million children estimated to be working in child labor, 71% of them work in agriculture. 
harvesting crops such as cotton under hazardous conditions, often uh, alongside their parents for very little or no pay instead of attending school. Addressing freedom of association, wages, and occupational safety and health is crucial to improving the economic and social outcomes for agriculture workers and farmers. So worker-driven social compliance can help identify and stop wage theft, inadequate payments, safety and health problems, and it will improve the lives of children and families. We have seen this demonstrated through the binding brand agreements, such as the Bangladesh International Accord, which has now expanded to Pakistan. We look forward to more examples of worker-driven remedy further down the, comply the cotton supply chain. Second, companies have a responsibility to know their supply chain beyond the first tier suppliers, or they do risk losing access to the US market. The Tariff Act of 1930s forced labor import ban and the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act do not give companies a pass on the far reaches of their supply chain. These measures ban the import into the United States of goods manufactured, produced, or mined with forced labor in whole or in part. If there is forced labor anywhere in a company's supply chain, whether you are aware of it or not, whether you have a direct employment relationship or not, those goods may be subject to customs action. This is a game changer. During calendar year 2023 alone, 10 entities were added to the UFLPA entity list. And in FY 2023, the Customs and Border Protection stopped $350 million worth of shipments under UFLPA enforcement. Referring specifically to apparel and footwear shipments with supply chain connections to Xinjiang, over half have been denied entry into the US market since the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act came into effect. Third, we need to shift away from the standard tick box corporate social audit practice and towards worker-driven social compliance. High profile failures like the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh are tragically common, where numerous audits were conducted with no real changes in the abysmal working conditions of these factories, including the very day before the building collapsed, killing almost 1,100 workers. Social audits are expensive, they measure a situation at one point in time. They often do not involve workers or fail to paint a full picture of working conditions, including respect for workers' rights. I know Goodweave engages in community-driven uh, compliance. And I think part of our job is to build a bridge and to find connections between communities and uh, organizations and worker organizations so that we can make sure that both communities and workers are part of this process. And I hope we're gonna talk more about that in the panel in more detail. We know that $27 billion is expected to be spent on voluntary social audits by 2026. If even a fraction of audit money were diverted from voluntary mechanisms into instituting effective enforcement, grievance, remediation, and feedback mechanisms and raising wages for working parents at the very bottom of the supply chain, we would see very different outcomes. In closing, we don't expect corporations to take on the role of government and provide social protections for children. But there's a lot that companies can do that they're not doing right now. Companies can provide living wages so that families can afford childcare. They can sign neutrality agreements, pledging to stay neutral if employers, em employees choose to form a union. They can work with governments to address social protection and advocate for worker voice. They can support governments that are seeking adequate resources for labor enforcement and labor regulations that meet international standards. And they can use the tools and resources available to end child labor in their supply chain. Goodweave has a lot of these resources and the U US Department of Labor has an eight step comply chain tool, which is on our website. It serves as a guide for companies and small and medium sized businesses on how to leverage worker driven social compliance to end child and forced labor. And DOL's Global Trace Protocol and Streams projects leverage emerging technologies such as blockchain, isotope testing, and DNA markers to pilot traceability mechanisms along the cotton supply chains in Pakistan and India. The objective is to enhance transparency and thus promote efforts to address labor practices along cotton supply chains. I am optimistic that partnerships and collaborations with governments, unions, companies, and civil society stakeholders can lead to more effective and meaningful actions for addressing the root causes of child labor. As we ensure good jobs for all workers, where their collective voices are front and center, 
we give children a chance for a better future. I'm so excited to hear from the panelists uh, as we dig into these urgent and fascinating subjects. So look forward to the conversation that comes and thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to John and his Good Weave team. Thank you, Thea. That is terrific. We now you know, can see through clearly to the leadership that you're bringing, that iLab is bringing, and that the Biden-Harris administration is bringing to challenge us to go faster, to go deeper, to go further on these challenges together. Appreciate that. We now have some speakers to join this conversation. They're joining from four different countries, from four different time zones, and from four different stakeholder groups, reflecting our multi-stakeholder model. It's a strong basis for a, a rich and nuanced discussion. I just want to offer first some brief introductions of our speakers and thank them again for their time and their expertise that they're bringing to bear today. Marluz Filippo is project coordinator at the Fund Against Child Labor at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Marluz is based in The Hague in the Netherlands, and we're delighted to have her. Thank you. Marluz, you've previously worked and lived in East Africa for over 10 years, and she has focused there on projects to tackle child labor, stimulate youth employment, and enhance gender equality. Welcome. Vinti Singhal is Goodweave's own head of inspection, monitoring, and certification at Goodweave Certification Private Limited, based in Delhi, India. Vinti is our intrepid colleague who manages mapping and inspection work in our informal supply chains in several states in India. She has roughly 15 years of experience in community-driven social compliance and in the intersections with human and worker rights. Welcome, Vinti. Adil Rahman, head of human rights at ASOS, is based in London in the UK. Thanks for joining us, Adil. Adil is ex an experienced human rights specialist. He brings over 25 years of experience working with civil society, trade unions, and private sector companies to address labor and human rights issues in company supply chains. Currently, as the head of human rights at ASOS, he leads, manages, and develops the company's human rights strategy globally through the Fashion with Integrity program. Welcome. And finally, last, but certainly not least, is Nasir Chowdhury, Project Director at Winrock International. He's based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Nasir has spent his whole career on projects focusing on countering child labor and human trafficking, and on enhancing ethical recruitment of labor migrants, and enhancing due diligence in apparel supply chains. Thank you, Nasir, as well, for joining us today, all the way from DACA. Now I want to start with our questions. We'll take, uh, you know, rapid fire, uh, you know, responses to be able to keep it dynamic and interactive. Uh, we're delighted to have then these speakers weighing in on several topics um, that we'll bring to the bring to the bear and bring to the fore. The first topic for today is visibility in supply chains, transparency, in other words. And the first question is for you, Adil. Can you please share a bit about how ASOS approaches supply chain visibility and child labor risk as part of its due diligence? Uh, yes, of course. Um, actually, I just wanted to start by saying I thought Thea's presentation actually covered a massive amount of what is really required. But I think, and we're going to go into that in a minute, and particularly all of the things he said, but but, but the start of it around the transparency piece, obviously, and I know um, considering where child labor is, but also a lot of the other issues that create child labor as well, for example, the wages, freedom of association, uh, ultimately gender, which is really, really important as well, uh, particularly in the garment industry, where I think it's over 80% of all workers in, in factories are, are women. That That's also an issue. But for us, the, the kind of, I think the key thing is, is, is not just the transparency. I know for many years, many trade unions, civil society, et cetera, have campaigned for a greater level of transparency with it from garment companies, et cetera. Um, and I think that, that lack of transparency, that's still there from a lot of brands, I think also enables poor working conditions to be either undetected, uh, accountability is weak, and obviously it poses a great risk, not just to all the workers and everything else, but also poses a great risk to the business as well, as we were talking about consumers later on. We've, as ASOS, we've, we've already had those kind of issues. I think 10 years ago, ASOS was in a lot of uh, media coverage and papers around child labor in its garment factories in Turkey uh, and in a couple of other countries, in China as well. That discovery, I think, really highlighted a big change within ASOS about 
transparency being not just one of the most important things, but we look at every single level of our factories at the moment, trying to map them. We publish them on our website. We make sure that they're all available to all of the NGOs. We have a global framework agreement with Industrial, which is the global union, and we mail out every two months, every one of our factories globally to every union uh, in whatever country we're in. That discovery, but also the, the result of that has made sure that what we're doing is, is as ASOS is sending a message very clearly to yourselves, but also to all of the civil societies in those countries that we are open for communication. What we want to do is not, and I'm going to be honest, not stand in the shadows, etc. wait for something bad to happen. Thea mentioned Rana Plaza, etc. but there's been huge issues before and after. But what we're trying to do is ensure that the communication with local partners in country with local organizations, local community context understanding, understanding the workers, understanding why child labor is happening, et cetera, is that communication we can have. So what we're not doing is sat, and I'm going to be honest here, sat 5,000 miles away trying to build a strategy uh, and then flying over and, and trying to implement something that, to be honest, doesn't need to be there. Those strategies are already in place because people like yourselves and other organizations have been working for decades in trying to combat human rights issues and particularly on child labor and i think that's the most important thing as well is the is not just the transparency but i think the legislation to ensure transparency happens a lot sooner instead of and i'm just going to be honest it's taken a long time for us to kind of get that momentum going but i think legislation to say every single brand that does business has the responsibility if they're going to be in business to publish all of their sites i think that has to be a, a key kind of next step as well thank you adil for bringing up a lot of really important points on on transparency um and the different roles of the different actors in in so doing i just i'll come back at our at our conclusion to just highlighting some of those um points uh, that you're making thank you uh we'll come back to you i want to move to an issue of child labor risk identification of course all these issues and topics are linked uh, i want to turn to vinti my dear colleague uh can you share vinti a few uh, examples one or two perhaps from your work monitoring child labor risk in the, the hidden tiers of global supply chains in India, in particular, the garment supply chains that we, we inspect. How do deep mapping and the frequent, random, unannounced inspections that we conduct lead you to identify child labor? Thank you, John. Um, and I'll give two examples, actually. Uh, you know, one is from uh, this new um, garment exporter that we were onboarding uh, and uh, they made uh, highly embellished uh, garments and uh, as we were onboarding them, um, you know, they shared the supply chain list, uh, told us that their embellishment work happens at one unit um, and they've uh, made investments in ensuring that workers come to that unit and do embellishment and beat work rather than work being uh, distributed to households because they identify that uh, and they understand that there are risks of child labor in home-based uh, production. Um, so, um, you know, generally you would do uh, mapping and inspections uh, and we completed that first round and onboarded the export. Now, because Goodweave does uh, frequent unannounced uh, inspections, uh, you know, we went back to the unit uh, unannounced uh, and, um, you know, our team actually saw bundles and bundles of uh, embellished garments being unloaded uh, from a van uh, when they arrived at the unit. Um, you know, they completed the assessment um, and, uh, you know, concluded that, you know, most production, uh, you know, in this particular uh, unit was being outsourced. Uh, so this wasn't really a production center. It was a distribution center. So over several weeks, uh, we completed the mapping and uh, monitoring and identified over 20 uh, uh, you know, subcontractor, uh, subcontractors and village intermediaries, over 250 households who were linked to this uh, distribution center. Um, you know, I would say that uh, we were able to identify this hidden supply chain because of the frequent unannounced uh, mapping and inspections that we uh, conduct. Right. Um, another example is from an exporter who's already part of the Goodby program and uh, has been working with us for a couple of years. And uh, they disclosed uh, that, you know, they started production in a new region and uh, they gave us the name of the subcontractor. And then when we did uh, our initial audits, uh, we didn't really uh, uh, find anything. And then over a couple uh, period of couple of months, uh, you know, we went back again, uh, you know, during this unannounced uh, uh, visits. And then we identified that there's a high concentration of uh, 
uh, child labor cases uh, in the supply chain. Now, in both uh, you know cases, um, what looked like safe or uh, risk-free supply chains, we identified a number of uh, child labor cases. Now, this was possible uh, because there was a continuous monitoring and mapping exercise that was happening, right? Um, last year uh, in India, uh, you know, could be uh, so an 11 time increase in child labor cases. And 100% of these cases were in the informal uh, supply chain. They were at subcontracting units and they were at, uh, in the household production. So, you know, um, basically to sum up, uh, you know, unless you keep doing this uh, exercise of mapping, going back again, finding if the connections have changed, if productions have changed, regions have changed, and keep doing this again and again, you will never identify uh, hidden supply chains. You will never identify uh, you know, high risks and child labor. So yeah, I think uh, monitoring mapping, uh, not a one-time exercise, frequent and continuous over a period of uh, you know, multiple uh, years and not just a, a one-year uh, program uh, with some companies is important. Thanks, Finti. Uh, and bringing to the fore that statistic, uh, an 11 times increase, um, you know, in 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 inspections, and, uh, and th this is then, you know, in, in, due to the worksite proliferation, and in the case, the, also the cases of child labor proliferating in India has meant a, an enormous challenge uh, for us collectively, and trying to invite other stakeholders into that challenge with us here. Thank you for sharing those examples, uh, Marluce. May I turn to you? Um, your agency in the Dutch government, RVO, supports companies in improving their uh, their child labor due diligence. What have been some of the company's you know successes and challenges with child labor risk identification, specifically since we're discussing today the garment sector, uh, looking at that uh, particular sector and its challenges? Over to you. Okay, thank you. Well, let me first start uh, explaining briefly what uh, uh, RVO uh, does with the Fund Against Child Labour. Uh, the Fund Against Child Labour is a program from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs implemented by RVO. And what we are doing is that we are supporting Dutch companies uh, to address uh, uh, child labour in their international supply chain uh, and to do uh, a thorough risk uh, analysis um, and uh, look at the incidence and prevalence of child labour uh, in their chain. Uh, and what makes this process of uh, identification really challenging is that it requires companies, uh, which others have also said, to not just go to the first tier of their uh, supply chain, but really go to the subcontractors and their subcontractors and to the home-based workers and all the way you know, to everyone who's involved in the production of goods, which is, uh, which is difficult and challenging. And, and these, 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 especially these informal, um, informal workers are not always very visible. Um, and usually uh, the buyers have a very strong relationship with the first tier at the main factory. Uh, and this is also where the audits takes place. And then someone mentioned even the, the announced audits. Um, but it becomes more difficult um, when you want to map out the other subcontractors. And the setup of the Fund Against Child Labour um, uh, reserves a lot of money and time to do this identification or this mapping exercise. And what we have seen with many of our projects that we are supporting is that only when sufficient resources become available, which is finance, money, but also experts on the ground with a law with a strong local network uh, um, uh, you know who are engaging with uh, with stakeholders then this uh, uh, I did the, this exercise becomes possible um and what we also see is that uh, a strong relationship building with uh, with um, uh, factories and, and the suppliers is important um and that there's some kind of trust uh, between the different uh, players. Um, because when uh, abuses or cases are identified, um, that it will not immediately uh, result in a termination of the contract or a cease of the working relationship. Um, because if that happens, um, you know, then 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 either the the buyer starts working with another company or the child is moved to another site, which is of course not a solution at all. Um, so at RVO, we're also trying to be a bit careful with really promoting this. Uh, uh, zero tolerance attitude or zero tolerance policies uh, because that makes the identification exercise really tough and there's also this risk that 
sort of like false uh, false uh, conclusions are drawn from this exercise whereby you no know, cases are found and, and there's no risk at all, um, uh, which is, uh, as we know, and I think you explained it uh, well in your introduction, is not the case at all. So instead, we really try to advocate for an assess and address approach. Thank you. Thanks, Marluz. Those are great insights. And we have, as you can tell, uh, to participants in the chat, um, you know, the resources coming forward, including uh, from RVO, FBK, uh, Marluz's agency, to see, you know, to bring to life the, 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 what she's just spoken of in her comment. Thanks, Marluz. Um, so as we top 100 participants in, in our, our uh uh, our participation today. I'm delighted to see us reach that that milestone. I just want to turn it to you, Nasir. I have a question about work. Um, you know, in your some of your previous work, it's highlighted some of the gaps in labor policies and in the rights of workers uh, associated with those gaps that are then you know employed in informal apparel work sites in Bangladesh. Can you just tell us a bit more about some of those gaps and how they can contribute to child labor, Nasir? Sure. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Thea and my uh, fellow panelists, Adil, Vinti, and Marlouz, because they have given a wonderful platform to talk about. They have covered visibility, risk assessment, and uh, identification. So, uh, informal apparel factories in Bangladesh, they operate in clusters in several hubs across the country, uh, particularly in Narangonj, uh, Chattogram, and two uh, sub-districts of Dhaka, Karaniganj, and uh, Mirpur. So uh, these informal factories are actually hosted in multi-story building, known as towers, locally known as towers. On each of, uh, uh, each of the floor of this tower, there are several factories uh, on an average size of 700 to 1,000 square feet having uh, around 15 to 20 workers in each factory. So uh, most of the workers in these factories, they live in the factory premises, including the child labor, and that opened the door for the exploitations of the children. In 2020 and 2021, we conducted a survey on 11,555 workers in Karaniganj and Narangonj. And we found that more than 800 or around 7% of them were children below age uh, 14. And if you consider uh, the age between 14 to 17, uh, the number is even higher. And it was 18% in Karaniganj, 20% in uh, Narangonj. And unfortunately, more than 56% of those workers reported conditions of forced labor as per the six uh, forced uh, labor indicators uh, uh, suggested by ILO. So, the fact is that the government of Bangladesh has committed to eliminating child labor by 2025 as per the National Plan of Action 2020. However, these informal factories remain invisible to inspection, uh, to monitoring of the authority. As per the local law, an apparel factory, a factory establishment must have at least 100 workers to form a trade union. Since these informal factories have a small number of workers, they are not even eligible to form any formal workers' bodies. And as a result, the factory owners, most of whom were once upon a time workers themselves, they take advantage of this policy gap and engage child labor since these children work for either free or for a nominal ways. Yeah, that's the problem uh, in terms of the policy, and that's the issue we have in the informal uh, factories in Bangladesh. Uh, over to you, John. Thank you, Nasir. These are really important gaps to um, bring to light um, through your work, and I'm taking you know taking note of a few of those those gaps: fault, small factory gap, uh, young workers, and and other child labor in informal sector. Settings. This is a very important, um, you know, set of issues. Again, to bring to the fore when we can sometimes otherwise expect just a tier one treatment when we need to go deeper. Thank you for that. So I will take our panel now to the topic of remediation. 
Um, we have, of course, uh, the right to remedy captured in a number of international frameworks, uh, not least the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, um, when, with the, the right to remedy for rights holders when uh, human rights and worker, including worker rights, um, violations or abuses occur, uh, and to have shared responsibility of public and private sector actors to bring remedy. So I want to then um, take up back to you, Adil. Um, just this question of, you know, whether you can provide some more insight for, from ASOS's particular approach to child labor remediation. Uh, what are some of the most difficult aspects? That we know full well how challenging it can be. So I'm just asking, you know, for your perspective on what's difficult about it, both in dealing with suppliers, but also in terms of providing rehabilitation for the child. Uh, absolutely. Okay. So um, I, I I suppose the first thing is is there, there was a bit about the kind of the trust that you need to have with all all of our suppliers as well, uh, and and the kind of understanding I suppose that we need to send out that it's um, it's okay not to be okay in some ways when it comes to child labour. Obviously, we have very important policies and rules that the business has set out, and we're making sure that when we first onboard any supplier, anybody comes in you know, not only do all of the suppliers know what our rules are, et cetera, but these are no goals, you know, the forced labor, child labor, et cetera. But also it's, a, it, it's, it's about understanding like the transparency piece. I mean, the amazing work that Goodweave does has allowed us, because we know we can't do it on our own, right? Okay, and we know that unless, and, and that's the transparency piece again, because if you can put all of that out, we can then look at all the brands in there. We can all come to Goodweave. We can all say we're in this region, for example, that's just been mentioned. We're all in this region. We know that in those lower levels, it is really difficult to find not only all the sites because they're, they're fragmented, disparate, etc. And how do we get them all together, etc. And and it, it puts accountability back on us, the brand reputation as well. But also, we're able to come to you to, collectively in a in how to move the industry forward together. It, does that make sense? Instead of it one brand at a time, it, it's all of us coming together. And I just want to say thank you for all all of the people who have said everything because the people on the call are really i mean so, some of the stuff that's already been said is really important about how we not just engage but the next bit about remediation child labor is uh, it's increasing i mean you know the, the climate change piece is, is coming i mean even if you look at the work you're doing in bangladesh but you know within 10 years people are going to literally walk into forced labor they're going to walk child labor etc when, when all of those issues happen as well in 10 years in, in Bangladesh as well. So we need to get prepared now. And this is the work that I think Goodweave is, is, is bringing us all together. There's an organization, you've got all the resources there, you've got, and I'm going to be honest, really important people from the US and everybody else that can ensure that brands have to step up and step step to the, to the plate as well. Instead of waiting for something to happen, they need to be engaged in the conversations with all of us and yourselves. But I think... <laughs> On, on, aside from that, there was a bit about, for example, even if you look at the accord, you know, the, the, the Bangladesh accord, there was many other disasters that happened before that. And it happened through subcontract, happened in all those lower levels. People walked out of that factory, but they had to go back in because the management came out and said, if you don't go back in, you will all be fired. P poverty plays a massive role. We all know that. So, yes, you know, we need to look at wages. We need to look at freedom association. We need to look at gender. But also the accord worked because it was a binding agreement. The only reason it worked was because it didn't rely on the goodwill of corporates. And I'm just going to be honest, the, the goodwill of all of us to say, wouldn't this be a nice thing to do? It actually, the accord said, if you're going to do business, you have to sign this. And there is a legally binding piece that you have to sign up to. And if you don't do it, then you will be held to account. So I think I, I, in the remediation piece, where, where we as ASOS come, we have a very I mean, obviously, we engage with yourselves. We have local women's organizations in every single region that we engage with on a day to day basis. That also, when we identify child labor, what we do is, is that women's organization visits the family. We make sure that that child then goes to school all the way, not just for three months, because there's no point like you were just saying as well. You say to a, a, a supplier, if we find it, then it's going to be goodbye. No, we're saying we're going to work with you. We're going to pay living wage to that family. We're going to employ someone from that family back into that factory. We're going to ensure that that supplier and that factory has all of the right, so we say policies in place and everything else, to be to be able to try to move it forward as well. But what we then do is is we make sure that women's organisation visits that family once a week, 
and they go and they ensure that that child is then going to school, any other support. And it's not just for the, the kind of, you know, like 11 year old up to 15, 16, it's all the way up to university, if that is what they need. And I know that's a little bit above and beyond, but but what it does is, is we're trying to build a relationship with local organization. Obviously, Goodweave, the, the work you do is amazing. And when you expand, and like we're working with you now in Bangladesh, for us, it's it's a huge benefit. We don't have, and I'm going to be honest, we don't have the skills. We don't have the understanding. We definitely don't have the experience that you, that, that from all the work that you've already done, that you have, and with the local people that you have. So for us, this is a godsend, right? It's, it's like, oh my God, here's an organization that's done so much over so many decades. We can work with you. But in other regions as well, I think, I think there has to be a bit of a, a push for brands to have more of a policy-based business policy where you can engage with them about what policies they should have in place that they need to engage with and then come to you for that kind of advice. There needs to be a conversation as well about, and I know I said about legislation, but I'm not going to go back, but the ownership of issue remediation, it, it's, about, it's about telling people as well that, yes, you know, like we found child labour, but we're on it. We know everybody has it, like you said at the start, everybody has child labour in their supply chain. Anybody who says any different, and I'm going to be, is, either, is a liar, or, or the devil, because there's no way nobody can say it. Because as brands I speak to, and I've been in the business, I was old 20 years ago, now I'm really old, but I speak to lots of brands. We're all in the same regions. We're all working in the set. We all know that child labor is there. We all need to be a lot more open about it. You said that as well. We all need to be a lot more honest about the fact that it's in our thing is how are we going to get to those lower levels, which is really difficult. When we get that ownership and we can move it over, obviously the public monitoring collective action, like you're saying as well, with yourselves on the ground and the work you do about then looking at how you can look at all the trends that are happening and how we how we can engage with you on lots of different levels, whether it's legislation, whether it's policies within the business, whether it's on the ground, how we can engage with you to move the, 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 the kind of conversations a lot more forward and more importantly, speak to other brands about bringing them in and engaging with you as well to make sure that as a as a whole industry we can move that forward. And then just one fact, sorry, I don't, I don't want to talk too much. But then just just the other fa the, the final bit I was going to say was there is the reason why Good Weave is good as well is it, it look it, what the brands do is they do the audits, okay? And we all have, and I'm going to be honest, huge companies that go and do our audits, and it's a it, it's a piece of paper that provides a, a, a legally binding document that you're not going to get sued, even though you know, like even last uh, last year in Morocco, for example, 26 women died in a factory. Um, but so these things are still happening. We can either wait for the next, you know, climate, environmental, or catastrophe like Rana Plaza, or what we can do is we can be a lot more proactive now and start those conversations with a lot of other brands to say, let's all meet with Goodweave, with other organizations that are, that are there as well, doing that kind of work. But the, the shift of paradigm within the fashion industry, because it is a very, I mean, we're, we're in the same countries because it's the lowest wages in the world, okay? That, that's, that's where a lot of garment companies are. But we need to have those conversations because child labor is the most important thing. If you, if some of the fact, and I'm gonna be honest, some of the places I've seen where child labor happens, are, are the most, I mean, they're, they're really medieval, a, a lot of places like that. So we need to access them now. We've been talking about this, and I'm not going to, this shows you how bad I am then. I've been talking about this for 30 years, talking about it for 20 years, 10 years. And I think now we're in a situation where if we can be a lot more open and a lot more honest, we can make some real difference to a lot of people and make it happen sooner rather than waiting for the the, you know the conversation about due diligence wait till something bad happens and then let's see if the brand does something it needs to be let's see if the brand is doing something to prevent something bad happening and that's what the brand needs to be now judged on thank you adil there's a lot of refreshing candor in your remarks and we need precisely that especially from industry um so thank you for that leadership and even some vulnerability because it it, it points then to unlocking solutions that we can bring to bear. You, you pointed to collective responses. Um, and I think we need then collective resourcing to, to mount those responses, uh, resourcing that um, good we brings what resources it has. And all the actors on this panel, and I'm sure many participants are needing then the resources, a, a, a paradigm shift in how we go about implementing 
the, the due diligence laws, the, the enforcement of labor laws on the books in places like Bangladesh um, will all take, uh, you know, a, a true commitment and deeper commitment uh, to, to resource the work, the hard work. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to some of those points. Um, I do want to turn to, to Vinti, uh, my teammate, as well as to Nasir, um, in, to round out this focus on remedy uh, when child labor cases occur. So Vinti, first to you. Um, I want to ask you about, again, a few examples from our work, because we can bring a lot to the fore of short, long-term remediation, rehabilitation, as we've addressed child labor on the ground in India. You know, what are the roles of the different actors um, in, in those examples, whether companies or suppliers, workers or communities, the families themselves of the children? It would be helpful to just bring some insight from the ground. Sure. Um, you know, when we really identify suspected child labor, you know, um, we pause uh, our inspections really and then focus on, you know, implementing the good pay policy and the procedures and remedies. Um, you know, the first and foremost is keeping the best interests of the child in mind. You know, that's like the core. Everything else is secondary. Um, and then, you know, withdrawing the child from work or in exploitative situations, or, you know, that follows. Um, counseling again very important uh, you know we uh, uh, we work with the parents who work with the child work with the unit owners who employ uh, these children and families um but then you know uh, accessing educational opportunities uh, is important so could we work so uh, with the family with the child with the uh, unit owners uh, to see what sort of educational opportunities uh, are available it's a case by case approach. You know, every case is different. Uh, the way uh, and where they are uh, employed is different. So, of course, uh, remediation uh, changes based on their current situation. Um, and then, you know, of course, once um, uh, once they're enrolled in school, we do frequent follow up uh, inspections and visits to school to see whether the child is, uh, you know, continuing education and is not returning back to uh, work. So that's, uh, you know, in the short term, uh, these are important steps that we follow. Um, in terms of longer term uh, remediation, I think uh, what we really uh, like to do is set up a community-based uh, prevention programming, especially where there is a high concentration of uh, child labor cases or a region where we feel that, you know, um, general education uh, opportunities are low and, uh, you know, uh, going to each house or each unit will not resolve the problem because it's not, you know, the production will move from this house uh, to the other if we say that there is child labor. So, you know, working uh, with the communities, with the supply chain partners and kind of working out on uh, prevention programming. Um, in terms of, um, you know, stakeholders, I think, uh, of course, they play a vital role. Uh, I think, uh, you know, changing business practices uh, uh, awareness raising or trainings and other uh, interventions uh, that eliminate the conditions uh, that cause child labor to arise in the first place. Uh, that's possible only when stakeholders engage. And, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, supply chains are complex, uh, you know, there's not just one person that you can go to, you know, uh, we all know that, you know, it isn't just the exporter, it isn't just the brand, it isn't just the subcontractor or the village intermediary or the household. They're just multiple people. So working with all of them, uh, you know, collectively uh, to see what re uh, remediation options uh, are best suited uh, for each case. I think that's what we follow uh, when we identify cases like this. Vindy, thank you for both the specificity and the brevity of, of those examples. Uh, it's very useful. I want to turn to number one and invite uh, our participants here to begin to submit any questions um, through the Q&A uh, function to then be able to engage with them uh, quite soon um, with the rest of you. And really delighted to have so many of you with us today. So please submit questions through the Q&A. Uh, coming soon. Um, and in the meantime, I just want to um, yeah, invite panelists uh, to keep uh, responses brief so we can cover some of these crucial topics. Um, you know, and so Nasir, perhaps in, in a minute or so, just share a bit from yeah. your perspective about this question of remedy, please, um, from Winrock's perspective and yours. What does it look like for a child to realize that right to remedy and what support services and social protections need to be in place for uh, for children that are linked to Bangladeshi apparel factories and global apparel brands? Sure. Thank you, uh, John. And thanks to Vinti. She has covered a lot of things, so I will be quick because she uh, covered most of the key uh, issues 
it's actually a very complex and multi-layer process. Uh, in 2020, we conducted a study on workers of informal employment factories, and we found that 96% of them were migrants coming from uh, impoverished areas of the country. Uh, Adil, Adil has already pointed out the importance of addressing poverty, so it's inevitable. Uh, in this study, uh, half of the children, they mentioned poverty as the key driving factor for being forced to work in the factory. Uh, what happened, uh, parents send their children to these factories via relatives uh, or their neighbors as they can't afford to feed the children. And children work in these factories as a helper to adult workers in exchange of foods uh, uh, and accommodations in the factory premises. And uh, uh, we, uh, we actually found that some children even reported of experiencing uh, sexual harassment, physical abuse, abuse and exploitations. So we had two projects, one uh, identified child level and another provided referral support services. And based on those experience, uh, I'd like to say that children under the age of 14 can be referred to general education. However, that's really, really important. Uh, mainstream education uh, doesn't suit this group of uh, children as we uh, experience. Uh, they have a gap or face difficulties in coping with the mainstream system. And it has to be uh, uh, customized. It has to be uh, easy to grab and fun to continue uh, kind of educations. For example, we, uh, after some trial and error, we introduce learning through playing method. And also when it comes to the children, uh, age between 14 and 17, they can be referred to skills development or vocational education so that they end up in decent works and can support the families. Uh, and it's also important to to engage their parents in income generating activities. Because at the end of the day, these children are coming from very poor families. And also it's important to link the families with various safety net programs uh, that uh, are provided by the government. John, over to you. Thank you, Nasir, for bringing to the fore also this root cause of poverty mm -hmm. and what it means for how children have to you know, make this transition from work to school with a lot of nuance um, and a lot of challenge that we need to, you know, anticipate and intervene, you know, carefully and thoughtfully. Thank you. Um, I I want to then make sure that you know, in 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 taking up a, a final comment um, from from you, Marlous, and also anything quick to add uh, from other speakers here, that we just take up this fourth topic for the session that we would had pointed out, and it's coming up in some of the Q and A that we're receiving as well, which is about rights holder engagement. Uh, and so uh, this is really then a, a you know in a multi-stakeholder approach to conducting child labor due diligence, Marlous. I want to just ask you how you know the Dutch government in encourages such an approach, and I just was curious what you would say about some of the key benefits for companies that engage with rights holders and stakeholders, and also with local partners, like we heard about from Adil, that you know in, in engaging them in directly designing interventions, um, what you see as some of those experiences and some of those benefits. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. Well, in fact, it's uh, it's mandatory for uh, for companies to join into a multi-stakeholder uh, partnership when they apply for our funding. So the 50 plus projects that we have funded are all consisting of a Dutch company, a local company, and an, an NGO can be an international one, but preferably one with like strong uh, understanding and, and presence on the ground. Um, and after that, uh, a multi-stakeholder analysis takes place, which is again mandatory to to really map out what is uh, what is happening and who are all the stakeholders on board. Um, as uh, as the previous speaker Nasir already mentioned, uh, child labor is very sad and very complex, and one of the main main root causes is poverty. And one when a company wants to design um, a due diligence approach. Um, to tackle this, they cannot accomplish this by themselves. The task is simply too huge. They cannot do this by themselves. So, uh, and they also shouldn't do this by themselves because if they do uh, uh, from, from, from their offices in, in, in the UK or in the Netherlands, uh, there's a very good chance that the solutions they come up with uh, to uh, mitigate adverse impacts uh, won't be really effective nor sustainable. Um, 
Um, so yeah, it's really important that uh, once the stakeholders are, are, are known, um, they are involved uh, to develop a joint action plan. Um, and what we have seen um, also uh, as, as a challenge is when a company or an NGO is very, very strongly motivated and, and it really strongly takes the um, it takes the lead in uh, in designing up uh, an action plan or, 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 or mitigation measures. Uh, it becomes very difficult for them to hear and understand the local perspectives and the the views on on child labor due diligence. So um, and then it becomes of course impossible the, to design uh, effective interventions. Um, so yeah, hence we encourage very much uh, social dialogue, uh, uh, stakeholder discussions, focus group discussions, etc. Um, it sounds maybe easier than than it is because there's of course this huge power imbalance uh, between the buyer, uh, the factory, uh, the subcontractor, and then the home based worker, and, and of course where the children and their families are are at the most uh, vulnerable end. Um, so what we've noticed in the projects is that. To, to really get these perspectives from, from the local communities and from, from the people who are, who are most involved with it and the children and their families, capacity building is necessary um, so that their voices are being heard. Um, for example, uh, uh, in the garment sector, we have seen us uh, setting up or strengthening working committees, uh, unions and uh, facilitate uh, uh, social dialogue. Um, yeah, and this is this is this is this is really uh, this is really helpful. Um, in the agricultural sector, we also see a lot of capacity building, but then mainly towards strengthening farmers' cooperatives, uh, happening to ensure that they understand the market dynamics and pricing and contracting and such. Yes, over to you, John. Thanks, Marlous. That's terrific. I mean, what we're hearing there, just to uh, you know, one piece of that I want to pull out is just to, in a sense, lower the. Um, the, the inequity in the in, in the power dynamics there to uh, enable and empower uh, families, children, uh, workers through mechanisms for for voice, worker voice, including unions, to be able to um, have uh, the strong voice at at the table with factories, with brands, with suppliers, etc., uh, to to be part of solutions when um, with a strong hand. I think that's a really important point to bring to the fore. Um, all these rights are intersecting and interconnected. Uh, in fact, indivisible. So I now just want to pull out that that first example that we were receiving a Q and A um, question from an audience member about enhanced due diligence. I think this 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 focus on rights holder engagement and local partners is very much part of that. Thank you for that response. Uh, we've also had a question around climate change, and I want to turn to, could be from Nasir, uh, who has covered this, this intersection, but others would have perhaps perspectives to add. Um, I'd still be curious if you have more to say on this as well. I, we see this intersection and are increasingly leaning in on it at Goodweave around the climate crisis, the need for just transition for workers and communities to a green economy, and how that intersects uh, the, the whole climate challenge with the challenges of child labor and forced labor, frankly, that we've been confronting, um, you know, in, in for, for decades that could weave. So I'm just wondering if anyone uh, wants to comment on, on you know, this, this nexus of the climate challenge with the child labor challenge and to point to some ways that one can, uh, well, how, how they intersect and interact and also what solutions can be brought to bear. Nasir, I'll, I'll see if you have anything yeah. or, uh, and Adil sure. as well. Yeah. Uh, please jump in. So uh, at Windrock, we have been uh, implementing a project uh, aiming at the intersection between climate change and modern slavery, including trafficking. And it has been uh, fascinating and to some extent uh, disturbing in a sense because uh, as we all know, climate change uh, works as a multiplier to the existing socioeconomic vulnerabilities. And it's so complex. Uh, I I'll try to make it very brief because it, I feel excited uh, talking about this. It uh, can talk about hours after hours. So it depends on the context. It, for example, in Bangladesh, the northern, which is prone to a uh, slow onset, uh, in the south, it's prone to uh, rapid onset, and in the central, it's more prone to revaluation and so on. Uh, in, in those cases, actually, uh, climate change uh, affect uh, the communities differently. 
uh, if I summarize for all those areas, the common tendency is like, for example, a farmer uh, uh, who, who has lost his uh, crops to flash flood suddenly and end up being in a situation uh, having nothing to feed his family, what happens? In usual cases, they try to get rid of their uh, 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 child daughter, uh, just just uh, giving her to uh, uh, someone, probably their relatives or neighbors suggested, who ended up uh, being in a informal apparel sector in some cases, and also uh, they send their children, as I mentioned earlier, explained earlier, to work in unknown areas, unknown industries. And the important, important element is lack of access to finance in this crisis moment. There is a very uh, informal uh, 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 local traditions, a very common tradition, we found it everywhere, which is called dadon. It means taking uh, or borrowing money from an informal money lender on terms and conditions uh, he or she has to comply with. So for example, he has taken, let's say, uh, $1,000 uh, and he will work for that money lender for the next six months. And as a conditions, he has to go to some places in, in, uh, he doesn't even know. Uh, work as a uh, working in informal apparel factory, work as a, in a brick clean, uh, as a forced labor, and in other sectors like ship breaking and so on. And it created all sort of uh, vulnerable situations for those people. And they ended up being in uh, modern slavery or uh, being trafficked to uh, different places. Thanks, Nasir. That's really insightful about the, the, the ways in which uh, climate impacts can drive indebtedness, vulnerability, and uh, increased risk for child labor, forced labor, and the like. Uh, it's, it's very illustrative. Um, Adil, I want to just see if you have anything to, to add from your vantage point at ASOS and, um, and th across your experience on this nexus of, again, the climate crisis and how it comes to bear on the issue of child labor we're focused on today. Yeah, so... I th this is being recorded, so this probably will be career suicide. But I'm going to say it anyway. I think um, I think the first thing to start with is the, the climate change issue is is it, you know it's at the top of the agenda. If you look at consumers, and and I know this is an important kind of area as well, particularly with brands, the consumer is king and queen, right? Okay, and at the moment, the consumers, uh, obviously in the UK or whatever, etc., where, where we're based, uh, we we're getting emails regularly you know are we doing this on sustainability are we doing this etc but the link is very because it's impacting everyone now right okay even in the uk at the moment there's been you know over the last kind of few months huge storms etc it certainly is at the top of the agenda that there's now a bit of a change and there is a significant change where people are starting to realize how much of that climate change is impacting on human rights and that's already starting and that's already starting in all the media whatever and i'm going to be very honest you know in the uk the, the you know, it's not the best media, but they're really starting to pick up on it, right? Saying, look, you know, these brands should have done this, they should have done that. So there's a lot of pressure on brands at the moment as well around sustainability, climate change, but also what are we doing and how it impacts on human rights, but also the link. And, and a lot of consumers are linking what they're buying here and, and, and they put all that trust and responsibility on the brand, right? They say, look, we're going to buy this product. We're not going to take any, I'm going to be honest, we want to buy it, but we're making sure all the responsibilities on you to make sure there's no child labor, no more. But, but we can see that it's happening in a lot of the kind of, shall I say, the global south. And, and I'm going to be honest, following the, the latest kind of COP event, which didn't really come out with anything, you know, that, that that made a big impact in the UK as well. And I think consumers are really engaged now. And I think a lot of the NGOs and a lot of the trade unions, civil society, et cetera, are also now pushing that as well, saying, look, here's the link between sustainability happening on the ground, and this is how it impacts on human rights, on housing, education, and particularly on modern slavery and with the Modern Slavery Act here. So just, just to take it from that as well to say, Absolutely. The migrant labor issue, you know, that's always been an issue and we've had hundreds. But, you know, if you look at even in our backyard in the UK, only a few years ago with one of the major brands here, there was 5000 slaves in one area. 
right? That That's 5,000 actual forced delays. And out of doors, 500 with children. This is in, in the backyard in the UK, right? Okay. But when you, when you look at, obviously, when we're looking at Bangladesh, when we're looking at uh, India, Pakistan, everything else, yes, because we can see the temperatures, we, we're getting reports about it, etc. So at the moment, the brands have got a really elevated interest in what, what are we going to do about climate change? And it's at the top of everyone's agenda. How we now link that, I think, is going to be really important because, and I'm going to say it now, is that, yes, there are multi-stakeholder initiatives in the UK as well, right? Okay. However, and I'm going to be very honest, they are not, they're not ensuring that the brands are going to do what's needed, right? It, it would be better if we took the 26 billion that we spend on auditing and gave it to the workers, we'd make a whole big, whole, whole big difference. However, not that we're going to do that, but the problem is, is it, it creates a buffer. What it does is it, it sometimes what it does in the UK it creates a buffer between the brand and, and people like yourself to be able to have that genuine conversation with Goodweave, with local organizations, with local trade unions, local civil society. It is important that the brand has that conversation directly, not through a multi-stakeholder initiative. And sorry, I don't mean this model because the, the, I think in Denmark and everything, it's a lot different. But in the UK, what's happened is, is it, it's become a bit of a it's like a buffer zone. Right. You know, we, we pay an insurance. We join the multi-stakeholder initiative. And then what they'll do is if we have any issue, it goes through there and, and then they deal with it. Whereas I think really, again, it comes back down to the transparency piece. If you think about it, brands still don't publish all of their factory base, even to the moment where we're at. So we can say, look, we've only got tier one. We've only got tier two. What are we going to do about three, four, five, six, all the way down? So we can start having big conversations with the big players. I'm, Unfortunately, ASOS is not that big, but there are huge companies out there making billions in six months, made 21 billion, etc. That's where I think we need to allocate that resource, allocate that money on climate change. And I think some people are doing some amazing stuff already. And I think we need to link the child labor piece directly with those organizations already doing a lot on sustainability, somehow link them together, bring bring ourselves in. And then the final thing, sorry, is to say is Briefly. that we we work, yes, we work with a lot of trade unions. We work with every single trade union on the ground. There are good and bad in every organization. Sorry, I don't mean, you know, I've, I've worked, I'm a trade unionist myself. I've worked with trade unions all over. You find good trade unions, you find bad trade unions, etc. We work with Industrial, which is the global confederation. They tell us which, which unions to work with wherever. But I think the most important thing is, is that we have to engage with workers from a local level, like Nasir does, like Vinti does. On, on a local level where they can talk to people, bring people together, then we can then we can get because it's going to be difficult for them to be unionized in that in the way that we perceive it. Do, do you get what I mean? And I think that's a real problem as well. Thank you, um, Adil. I much covered there. Consumer and media pressures, for example, on companies to uh, address the climate and human rights nexus. Crucial point there. Also, then on this last point, which gets to the really a Q and A question that I want to go to next. This question and, and this crucial uh, role for independent democratic trade unions, right, the ones that are most representative of worker um, interests and, and aspirations. Um, I want to just understand from the panel, what, you know, this question that raised by a participant, you know, how effective um, and, and how to maximize, you know, the worker involvement in both mitigating child labor where it exists, and then the prevention of child labor, really by looking after the livelihoods of adult workers uh, in the informal sector. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you know panelists would say, recognizing some of the realities where the, the union density is quite low in the informal sector, the challenges of organize, worker organizing in the informal sector are vast in the countries we're discussing, as well as challenges that get to a, a Q&A question about the US, they are, they are challenging here as well for those that are highly vulnerable and informal workers here. And therefore we see some of the proliferation of child labor in the US um, as a result of some of these challenges of workers being able to um, you know, find voice through freedom of association um, and then to be able to you know, um, essentially address and monitor child labor um, you know, as a form of due diligence that actually works. So I was just curious then what others would say about this question of, of where workers can play a stronger role to Thea's challenge up front around moving toward a worker-driven social compliance model. What is our experience across these organizations you represent? Anyone want to jump in on that? Uh, I can. Go ahead. Feel free and be brief. Thank you, Nasir. 
Okay, so uh, when I, uh, we, we, I talked about uh, the child labor uh, found in uh, Narangonj and Karanagonj, two biggest uh, informal yeah. apparel hubs in Bangladesh. So uh, there is a big difference. Uh, so in Karanagonj, there were around uh, more than 10%. And uh, in Narangonj, there were only 4%, even though Narangonj is the larger hub. So we tried to identify why the difference. And one of the key reasons we found that in Narangonj, there are actually uh, lots of formal factories and existence of trade unions. And because of the existence of those trade unions and because of the awareness among the workers that actually put pressure uh, on the informal sector and influence in a way, and that reduces the prevalence of child labor in Narangonj compared to Kalinganj, where it doesn't have any formal factory setup. That's the first thing. And the second point I want to highlight in Karinganj, where there is no formal trade unions, but there are some informal worker associations. Uh, uh, we work with them. We actually involve them in several ways. And uh, they also want to get rid of child labor. The, the, the critical point is that I want the audience to understand this uh, uh, important fact. The child workers, the, ch the children who are working in the factories, they are the children of their, the workers' neighbors or relatives. So the workers who are the part of the associations, they actually know the parents of these children. And they also understand the pain points of those parents. So it's really, even though they want them to get out of the factories, but they can't because of the socioeconomic conditions of their parents. So in a sense, they have the desire, but they are in other way, resourceless, powerless. And that's why it's really, really important for the brands and the CSOs and the government to come forward to support these uh, informal associations and make them stronger. And in some way, if possible, make them a formal. Uh, Thank you, Nasir, for that takeaway. I want to turn to uh, Vinti and Marluz for any takeaways. We've heard from Adil and Nasir, really insightful pieces. We've heard from you as well, but I want to circle back to you both. Anything that you want to leave the audience with as we conclude uh, in this lightning round, looking to you for maybe 30 seconds of what you want to drive home to this crowd at this moment. Uh, Vinti, if I'm, well, Marluz or Vinti, whoever wants to jump in first, love to hear from you both briefly. Sure. Um, you know, just to add to what uh, you know, Nasir was saying. I think um, sometimes, uh, you know, when you have presence in communities uh, where there is a risk of child labor, uh, you know, uh, if you have locally uh, based team members, you know, they act as role models and uh, you know, uh, sharing of life examples um, uh, and success stories. Uh, you know, they are really confidants and uh, they help in. Uh, uh, you know, motivation and counseling. So, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, worker voices, um, you have local partners who are there in the community. So, you know, you will be able to engage with them uh, more quickly uh, in real time and uh, communication of what the actual needs are uh, will be uh, transparent and uh, quicker. So just to add that, uh, you know, one element about voice and uh, you know, how community-based uh, prevention programs and community-based team members can help. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Vinti, for bringing that home. Marluz. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I uh, I wanted to say I, I walk away from this session inspired and hopeful, but um, of course, when you talk with people in the producing countries and, 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 and with people working directly for the brands and you hear all these horrible stories, uh, you walk away still a bit with a heavy heart. However, I'm very, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I think I see, I'm still hopeful uh, since there are so many front runners and the pressure is increasing and there are brands who are, who are confident and, and, and willing to step up and to, to, to speak at this kind of like 
fora and, and share the challenges and share their uh, share their struggles with combating child labor in their supply chain. Uh, and I hope that um, uh, these companies can really inspire others to to do the same and, and to step up and to do more, because I think that whatever has been said here, uh, uh, there is enough evidence, there is enough practice out there for you to also do something it's 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 yeah it's it's all it's all there there are documents there are videos there are tools you can connect with 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 peers with colleagues with maybe concurrents uh competitors but um yeah you're not alone and uh, and, and and really the time is now and uh if child labor is increasing in the world uh, yeah we cannot uh, look away Thanks, Mara Luz. The time is now. Uh, it's now on in terms of the issue, and um, it happens to also be the time we have to round out our panel. These have been great final takes and takeaways on, on this. I want to just say that I've heard about increased ambition, collective action, political will, getting to root causes, including and especially to poverty, uh, to climate change as drivers of child labor, uh, the need to go deep, to be as community driven and especially as worker driven as we can as we go forward together. Um, I wanna just encourage now some um, use of the links that, that have been shared throughout the session to learn more about the work of our amazing speakers and their organizations, um, all working on these issues together. There are of course many more out there, including participants who are in organizations that are making a difference on eradicating child labor Labor. On behalf of Goodweave International, I do just want to give my thanks once again to the OECD for, for hosting uh, in, in, in the context of the forum, to our esteemed speakers who have been terrific, uh, dynamic, insightful, uh, and to our audience uh, for just being here for this session. I also just want to appreciate my team at Goodweave International. We would not have done this without actually months of preparation, thoughtful and thorough, to get to this point. I'm delighted with how it's gone. I just want to encourage all to enjoy the side sessions that carry on today to round out the OECD forum and enjoy le weekend, as they would say in Paris, uh, for whenever it arrives in your time zone. Um, you all deserve it. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing this engagement and this action together. Thank you all. Thank you all so Thank much. You also. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you, Thank you. to all our speakers, you. including you, Thea. Thank you for staying with us. Have a great weekend, all.